Hello and welcome to the 21st annual Las Vegas Jewish Film Festival. My name is Neil Popish and I am the program director with the Jewish Community Center of Southern Nevada, a division of Jewish Nevada. The Las Vegas Jewish Film Festival, Jewish Nevada, and the Anti-Defamation League are proud to partner for the free viewing of Miriam Bierman, Expressing the Chaos, and discussion with William Jaffe, Jonathan Gruber, and moderator Heather Harmon. Special thanks to all our generous Las Vegas Jewish Film Festival donors, grantors, and sponsors, including our media sponsor, the Las Vegas Review Journal. We also like to thank you, our audience, for your continued participation and for helping us build more awareness of this significant free monthly online cultural offering. Please visit the Las Vegas Jewish Film Festival's website at www.lvjff.org for coming films and links to past films and film discussion webinars. Special guests for the film discussion include our moderator, Heather Harmon, who works with artists, galleries, and museums on strategy, capital campaigns, long-term planning, and problem solving. Recently, she was director of the Nevada Museum of Art Las Vegas, helping lead the effort to establish an art museum in Southern Nevada. Heather also served as director of development for the Artist Space Gallery in New York and is currently on the board of the Black Mountain Institute and a member of Nevada Women's Philanthropy. Our other special guest is Miriam Bierman's son, William Jaffe, a lawyer who has worked for nonprofits and government. Bill lives in Washington, D.C. and is married to Jessica Lieberman, and they have two children. Bill has dedicated himself to the preservation and promotion of his mother's, Miriam's, art and legacy. Also joining us is film director Jonathan Gruber, who has worked on multiple documentary films, commercials, and videos. His work has been screened at festivals and in theaters around the world and has been broadcast on PBS, the History Channel, National Geographic, Discovery Network, and more. Really thrilled to be here with you both. Uh, Bill, do you prefer William or Bill? Bill. Bill, great to be here with you both, Bill and Jonathan. I'm very excited to discuss the film. have so many questions for you both. Um, and just wanted to start with, you know, Bill, I know you as Miriam's son and Jonathan with your vast experience in documentary filmmaking. How did the two of you come together and start in the creation of this wonderful film? Well, we were friends before the film and I knew he was- And we're still actor. friends after the film. <laughs> more or less, more or less. No, we are, we are, of course. And um, I knew he was an excellent filmmaker. And I knew I wanted to make a film about my mother and serendipity. We got to talking a little bit about, about um, Miriam's story. And, you know, I did say to, uh, to Bill that it would be a great, it would be a great story. And then it was just trying to find, you know, the right people who could help us, you know, with some of the, um, with some of the resources to help put it together. And, uh, and then it happened. And through your friendship, had, did you become familiar with Miriam's work? And did you have a chance to talk with her and hear anecdotes of her story before making the film? Um, I, I think I had only met her once. I think she came to, um, we came to, to Bill and Bill's family's house for a meal. And, and they were living in the, in the same apartment building at the time. And uh, we were just struck with how, how great Miriam was. She was fun to talk to, she was quick, she was witty. And, um, and then, you know, knowing about her work, it just seemed like, oh, this could be a really great film. One of the things that struck me first and foremost, because it jumps right out at you from the onset, is the film title, Expressing the Chaos. Where does that title come from? It's a quote from Miriam. She says, a lot of people, there's a lot of chaos in my work. A lot of people tried to, try to hide the chaos in their lives, but I'm expressing the chaos. So Jonathan just took it right from, the, right from my mother's statement. Wonderful. And Jonathan, did you wanna elaborate on that as well? Well, just walking into her studio and just seeing all of her work, I mean, chaos is what jumps out at me. And so, um, you know, I think I asked her, 
you know, that there, it feels like there's a lot of chaos. Tell me about it. And that, that was her answer. And it just was right on the nose and, you know, being, doing, um, being ex an expressionist painter or having, you know, a lot of expressionism in her work, it just seemed to make a lot of sense. Bill, what kind of things inspired Miriam? I mean, her work is very strong. It is very intense. I read in her artist statement that she said, I've spent most of my life creating images that are responses to the brutality of our time. So really what drove her in making her work? Well, you know, she says in the film that she never wanted to explain her art because that takes it down to a lower level. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm gonna honor that and not try to explain it either because that's already one step removed. But I, I think one thing that's interesting about, about my mother's work is it's really like four or five artists because you've got, the film doesn't go into all the different, um, the, the sort of really like the broad range of her work. It focuses a lot on the big paintings, big expressions mm -hmm. paintings. But there were also these beautiful abstract collages that in, in the early years were very minimalist and just like a few images on the page with lots of space. And as, as she got older, the, the images got more and more crowded together in the collages. But there were also, um, you know, the beautiful animals, the film does show the animals, and prints. She was a printmaker and she did a lot of prints. Um, she studied printmaking at Atelier 17 in Paris. Uh, while on a Fulbright to Paris and always was involved in print. So, you know, it's really, she's really like three or four or five artists and you really need more than those 50 minutes to really, you know, get in depth here. We went through so many images to decide, you know, which ones to use and just, just prolific. And there's so much work that we just couldn't show. And I think that that's, you know, the, the mark of a good film is if it doesn't give you all the answers and it leaves people wanting more to find out more about Miriam and her work. And do you both feel that in doing the film, you've been able to create increased visibility and recognition for Miriam and her work? Well, I think to some extent, definitely. I mean, she has been accepted in a number of uh, larger, more prestigious museums in the last few years, including the National Gallery of Art very recently. Um, and uh, I'm hoping to um, have her work shown more in Europe because I think there, would, there will be more of an appreciation for her in, in Europe, especially Germany and France. It seems that that early trip to Europe where she first encountered Goya um, really made a lasting impression on her. And maybe even, you know, because of where she grew up in the time, abstract expressionism being predominantly the language of painting, that, you know, it almost gave her artistic license to burst out and explore. When I first saw the work, I automatically thought of artists that were probably her contemporaries, but maybe she didn't know, but artists like Nancy Spiro, and oh, Leon she knew Nancy Spiro. She that knew Nancy Spiro. Wonderful. And, and Leon. I, I, I Leon Gallo. So. Yes, those were two artists that immediately came to mind, but I didn't find any connections in my research. But, you know, you could feel a strong conversation and kinship between them. And it seems like that, you know, trip to Europe and, and those kind of relationships really gave her artistic license to explore things that were very brave and unconventional. She was an iconoclast, you know, because growing up at coming of age in the 50s and the 60s, the dominant mode was abstraction or, or other things, conceptualism, pop. She wasn't interested in any of that. She did, she did what she had to do. You know, she said, I'm gonna be a figurative expressionist, even though no one gave two you know, anything about that back then. They didn't care about figurative expressions. It's only now that figurative expressionism is a little more in, you know, at the moment. And there was like this period in the early 80s um, with the neo-expressionists 
And in the Times, they talked about her in the early 80s. They said, well, she would be considered a neo-expressionist, except she's been doing this for long before the neo-expressionists were doing it. So she always did her own thing. You know, if, if they were not going to um, recognize her, she didn't care. She was going to do it anyway. And did she have a vision for her legacy or was that something through your work that you were able to translate into a reality through this film and through museum relationships that you've fostered and through these different connections with curators like Jonathan Binstock and others? Well, I, as I said in the film, I don't want the film to give the impression that the world found out about her through me. They found out about her through her mm -hmm. because she was already in a number of large museums before I got involved. And um, she did want to, you know, have more recognition in her lifetime, but she was too busy making the art. One of the curators <laughs> in the film says, you know, you can spend your time promoting yourself all the time, or you can make art. She decided just to make art. It seemed like you spent a lot of time with her. And, you know, I kept thinking to myself, what is a day in the life of Miriam? Like, I, I imagine her just waking up first thing in the morning and, you know, going right into the studio and starting to paint. And when you see just the sheer volume, it seems as though she had an extraordinary work ethic. So was she in the studio every day? As a little kid, obviously, having a family takes away from that. And there, you know, some of the, um, the Ninth Street women talked about that. They talked about how it was difficult to have a family. And one of them, one of the big Ninth Street women sort of resented you know, the family getting in the way of the art. I don't think she did. I don't think she No, she, she did. doesn't, didn't seem like that. Um, yeah. But, you know, I, I mean, my father died young. So she didn't, you know, when I left the house after college, she was basically alone. So she had a lot of alone time in which to create. Yeah. And Jonathan, in your research and your previous experience, how did that lend itself to this particular film? And how does it, you know, how did you translate this incredible work on screen? I mean, I, you know, I really enjoyed like the studio shots and having the feeling of being in her space, but what about your vast documentary film experience came in and informed this experience with Miriam? And what are the ways in which you were able to show work that's very visceral and complex on the screen and translate it to the viewer? Mm -hmm. Well, we, we had a lot of material to work with. I mean, thanks to Bill, who really, you know, has this amazing um, of photographs, and artwork, and then there was uh, material at the Smithsonian, um, at the uh, American, it's the AAA, I can't remember what it, what it stands for. Archives uh, of American Art. Archives of American Art. And then, then we have these incredible letters and um, that she had written from, uh, from Europe, uh, little sketches that make it into the film. So there was a lot of really, um, it was just greedy, you know, give me everything <laughs> and let me figure out exactly what you know what we can put in in terms of the technique because she has so much paint that she's really like it's a 3d it's three-dimensional really it's not just flat work um you know i spoke to to my uh to graphic artist who worked on the film andrew fetchko and i said how can we show something that's um 2d you know 3d in a two-dimensional medium and we we came up with this thing called the grand canyon which i call the grand canyon effect which is kind of what you see in the beginning where you're really flying low over the paintings. And the way that we did that was that we, we, we shot high resolution stills with shadows casting on each side. And so the computer then would um, be able to make some sort of a topographical map with these shadows. And then, um, and you could get that, you could get that effect. So that's how we did, we could get in close, we could get in low and we could really, you know, and, and also show all the colors you know, the amazing colors that Miriam uh, works with. Yeah, she was indeed an incredible colorist and the work itself is very vibrant and very alive. And, 
you know, her, her passion really, really comes through in the film, but also first and foremost comes through in her work. And a question for both of you, you know, what do you think drove her extraordinary perseverance and survival and determination? She had seemed to have such a tenacity for life. I think she had a lot of true grit. You know, she didn't let anything hold her back. I mean, as a child, she had incredible sickness. And then she came from this very uptight, stultifying, middle-class, New England background. And she had to totally break out of that. You know, she had to like go off to Europe and then go to the Lower East Side and live in the Lower East Side and, you know, have a... Where Jonathan hails from, the Lower East Side births creativity. (laughs) (laughs) And, uh, you know, wherever she lived, she had a, wherever we lived, she had a studio. Um, and she sacrificed a lot for her art. I mean, it's a cliche, but it's true. She, she sacrificed a lot. She didn't, she, you know, didn't never went after material things. She never went after like, you know, she never tried to, you know, I mean, it's not like she wasn't interested in selling her art. She was, but if, you know, if no one wanted to buy it, she wasn't making it for that reason. She was making it because she had, these, these statements that had to come out. And I think her friend, Yahweh Olnick, you know, who really hit it on the head in the film, she said, mm-hmm. she's extremely empathetic with this pain and suffering that she's in, in, encountered and seen in others, in war and tragedies and like Goya, she, you know, had these things that she had to say and she had to bear witness to these um, events in human history. Mm-hmm. So she had to do it, you know, she just felt compelled, I think. And, and you know, I was just working with materials mostly that existed already. The, the main interviews where Miriam is sort of describing her experiences were already captured by a student who, um, who just found Miriam compelling and did an interview with her. Uh, it was something like five years before um, we started working on the film. Um, when I started interviewing her and filming her, she, her memory was really pretty far gone already. So, you know, had that interview not been there, um, I would not have been able to make the film. There's no way I would have had the, the, the flow through or continuity because I don't like to make films with narration. It would, I want her telling her own story. And, uh, and so in terms of my own relationship to uh, to Miriam, it's really, you know, already when, when, when her short-term memory was, was pretty gone. So it was great that I was able to, to have this, uh, all this material to work with to really cobble together her story, but then also to talk about what's happening to her in the present. And you mentioned these letters, which don't necessarily come through in the film, but was she also uh, a copious and a uh, frequent letter writer? She was a poet, really. I mean, she wow. wrote she wrote a lot of poetry. And it, 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 this doesn't come through in the film because there just wasn't time, but she would incorporate poems of others or, or just these sort of poetic references into the works. Yes. And then a lot of the poetic references were with the titles. And now a lot of the titles, unfortunately, have disappeared because we didn't document it all so well um, during uh, the time when she was able to sort of remember and remember all the titles of these various works. So we have this certain amount of documentation, which is she took a lot of slides and wrote the titles on the actual you know, physical slide. So someone I'm hoping someday is going to make a book uh, if I find someone to do this and then, you know, sort of like put put all the titles with the um, with the works because otherwise this whole aspect this poetic poetic aspect of her um, of her work is going to be lost because the, the the poetry of the titles was very important in connection with the image. Understood. There was also this, um, you know, what you would share with me, Bill, is that often she would have works that she had, you know, she had made, who knows, sometimes decades earlier, and then would just kind of redo them, you know, that they didn't, um, they weren't, you know, in a canon necessarily. Right, right, right. She never threw anything away. 
but she was never prissy about her work. So she'd take a, she'd take a drawing that she did in the 60s and literally rip it up and rearrange it. And then that became a collage in the 80s. I wonder then, that, because when you see her in the film cutting up and almost re-editing some of the works, and this does appear quite frequently, and maybe it's the time period with which the film segments were made and taken, but you do see her collaging and cutting and putting back together, almost like she's reframing a problem right, or right, solving right. an issue or, you know, right. um, recontextualizing an earlier work. That's right, that's a good way to put it. And she also would work over uh, paintings. So the paintings of the early 60s and 70s, 60s and 70s were very thinly applied. The paint was very thinly applied. And then in the 80s and 90s, it was very thick. And one reason it was very thick was she was actually painting over prior paintings. And in the, in the film, there's this one self-portrait. It's like her last painting. Mm -hmm. And um, in the film, it shows first, this was the, you know, this was what it looked like. She says, I painted it with my hands. And then later, it, the image changes. Jonathan puts the final image on it. You see it's a totally different painting. But that whole painting had been done on top of an earlier painting from the wow. 60s. Wow. And I love that. There's this one scene where um, she's doing a lot of this collage work. It's this massive, um, on, it's a black space. And, and then all of a sudden she realizes that there, it, there's a lot of humidity in the basement. It's kind of, you know, buckled the actual paper. She's like, huh, I really like that. You know, it's really just speaks to, I think, as you were saying, the lack of prissiness or pretension. Mm -hmm. um, it's sort of like whatever is out there in front of her, you know, she can, she can make, uh, turn that into some sort of art. Yes, yeah, she seemed to have a veracity for information and such an incredible amount of drive and work ethic. I mean, you see right. the prolific output and even things that I've learned in our conversation about her foray in poetry and how important that was in titling her work and also that she did have this earlier work that we don't even see in terms of abs working in abstract expressionism. I wonder, Bill, as people are looking and seeking out Miriam's work, what's the best way for them to find more information about the work? And you know, even if they wanted to potentially acquire work, how can people get more Miriam? Well, you can always um, contact me, of course. But um, she has a she has an Instagram page where we're putting up a lot of interesting images from all over, you know, the 60 year span of her work. And um, she has a small gallery in New Jersey now, James Yarosh Gallery. And hopefully she's gonna be having some more shows. I mean, hopefully in the next couple of years, um, uh, other um, art venues are gonna take notice of her and uh, give her the due that she should have had, uh, you know, these last 30, 40, 50 years. And what is the Instagram called for our loyal? Oh, it's just called Miriam Bierman Art. But if you just followers. put Miriam Bierman in, it'll come up on Instagram. And you have a website as well with your yeah. contact information where people can find you and find out more about Miriam's work. So what's next for both of you? Will you collaborate again? Are you working on other projects? Well, it was a great privilege for me to, to work with Jonathan. I don't know if that's ever gonna happen again, um, but I'd love to, uh, I have other ideas of other things to make films about, but I don't have any money with which to make them, unfortunately. <laughs> I love Bill's ideas. We're, we're collaborating, Bill and his family, they have a bar mitzvah coming up. Uh, <laughs> so that'll be exciting. And we'll, we'll take part in that in some way. Great, and what are you working on next, Jonathan? Um, I have a film that came out um, recently. It's kind of still on, you know, virtually being released about Menachem Begin, the former Israeli prime minister. And uh, next year, I hope to work on a film about Joe Lieberman, former senator. Um, mm -hmm. Also a film that I've been working on for a while on Oriana Falacci, the Italian journalist. So there's no shortage of uh, a project. Wonderful. 
Great. Well, thank you both. And it was really a pleasure to speak with you. And, and thank you for taking us on this wonderful journey, giving us a small glimpse into Miriam's life and work and for leaving us wanting more. Thank you, Heather. It's always good thank to you. talk about this stuff. And your questions were really quite insightful. Thank so you. Thanks. Thank you, Heather. Good to see you, Bill.